Unbelievable. Thank you. Abba Father, we do praise your holy name, and we pray for your presence to be with us as we try to unpack this lesson tonight, Lord. Help us to really understand what you're trying to say, and help me just to sit on the things that we, you want us to walk away with. We pray this in your most high name, Lord Jesus. Amen. This week's lesson is extremely important for our walk with the Lord in a number of ways that I'm going to attempt to bring out in my teaching tonight. The clearest thing that I learned is how Moses fought to keep the very presence of God before him. And I think that's a good word for us too. He said he wouldn't move forward if God's presence wasn't with him. And I need to have that mindset, and that's my big takeaway. Moses knew intuitively, deep down inside him, this truth. Only with God's presence do we have hope. And he refused to go without it. So let's take a look at it. As I looked at this story, one of my favorite verses in the Bible reminded me how to act when I'm waiting on God. It's from Psalm 27, 14. It says, wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. The word wait in Hebrew is kava. It means wait, it means hope. It's a word picture of our spirit intertwining with God's spirit so that we have the strength to wait because it's hard. Think about it. What was it, 40 days? Actually, probably maybe closer to 45 days because, you know, God spoke the word to them. They did some things. Uh, the 70 elders and Aaron and his sons went up. They had the covenant meal that bound it. Then Moses went up for 40 days. So I'm sure that took a couple days of what they were doing. He's got a short memory. 40 days. But less were too hard on him. As I was reading, I was reading from a, a, a very wise rabbi. He's the head rabbi of the UK. He wrote this. So it was during the financial collapse that, sure, that will surely come to be known as the great crash of 2008. We, everyone in this room has lived through it. Less than a week before the collapse, at the beginning of August 2008, the British artist Damien Hertz put a sculpture up for sale at Sotheby's. It was sold for 10.5 million pounds. That's about, what, 13 and a half million dollars? One of the highest prices ever paid for the work of a living artist. In light of all that happened subsequently, it was as if heaven had sent a signal of what was going wrong in the contemporary West. The symbolic nature of the event lay in the name of the sculpture. Hertz called it the golden calf. Hertz sculpture was a symbol of what can happen when people turn gold, a medium of exchange, into an object of worship. The result, both times, was collectively folly and irrational exuberance. So lest we judge the Israelites too harshly, the finger comes back on us because we read what they did to screw up. Plus, we have the Holy Spirit, God's Ruach, his spirit in us, and we still commit the folly. So it's not easy. It's not hard, excuse me, to fall off the path. 
And the thing I want you to know is all of God's commandments, all his precepts and ways comes off the first two commandments. He starts off with the preamble, I am the Lord your God. You'll have no other gods besides me. Well, let me read that again. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. That was our verse, I think, last week. The first commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. And the second, you shall not make, uh, you shall make no idols. Off of those two commandments, everything is based. Remember what Jesus said when the, when the, uh, Lawyer came to him in Matthew, and he also said it in Mark, and it's in Luke. And I'm not sure, it might be in John 2. What is the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and to love your neighbor as yourself. You cannot love God. You cannot love God and worship an idol. They don't coexist. Moses comes down, and I'm not going to make this linear. I'm going to jump back into the prayers. So don't think I forgot it. Moses comes down from the mountain, and he looks and he sees what's going on, and he takes and he breaks the commandments. Here's what he did. It's, and all of Israel saw him do this. He annulled the covenant he had with God. He tore up the co covenant. And at, as of that moment, Israel was no longer a covenant people with God because it was written and he destroyed it. It was unratified. Big deal. Then he takes and he grinds up the... He grinds up the golden calf and he throws it in the water and he forces everyone to drink from it. That's symbolic and we're going to learn about it in a couple of weeks when we get to Numbers 5. It was a test to see if a woman committed adultery against her husband if he thought she did is take dust and throw it in the water and force him to drink it. And when they're drinking that they realize they committed adultery not only idolatry, adultery. It was a marriage covenant. Remember I mentioned that a couple of weeks ago? The ketubah is the Ten Commandments and all the other commandments. The ketubah is a marriage contract. So they committed adultery with other gods. And then we run into Aaron. Can you believe what he said to Moses? It was so ridiculous, Moses looked at him and walked away. He didn't even address it. We find out later in Deuteronomy 9 that at the same time that he was interceding for the Israelites up on the mountain, he was interceding for Aaron because he deserved to die for what he did. Then Moses called out for the Levites. Who is going to stand for God? He didn't call for the Levites. He asked who is going to do it. And the Levites said yes. And they went out that day and they killed 3,000. Why 3,000 out of 2 million? Maybe those are the ones that didn't drink from the water. Or those were the ones who were still partying. Or maybe they were the instigators. We don't know. But we know 3,000 died that day. Because the death is a punishment for idolatry. It's putting other gods above our God. But just so you don't think God is unjust, 1,500 years later, on the Feast of Pentecost, because this happened on the Feast of Pentecost, God sent his Holy Spirit, and 3,000 people became believers. So he balanced it off. So that's what we have. But then we get to the part I really want to sit on because this is a part that we can learn from. And that's the prayer part. 
And the Lord says to Moses, go down for your people whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way that I commanded them. They made for themselves a golden calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it. These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn against them, and I may consume them, in order that I make a great nation out of you. How many would have taken that deal that God offered Moses? But Moses isn't self Focus, he's God focused. Listen to his prayers. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt with a great power and with a mighty hand? Look at the chutzpah of Moses. God says, They're your people. And Moses says, No, they're your people. <laughs> he's putting it right back. What he's saying to God is, I understand. They may have fallen, but you chose this people. What are the Egyptians going to think of your holy name? Everything that comes out of Moses' mouth is concern for God. What are the Egyptians going to say? They're going to laugh at your holy name and who you are. And then he implied, by the way, why did you use your great power to bring them out if you're just going to kill them? Because you are Yahweh. Remember what that is? Eya, Asher, Eya. I am who I am. I was who I was, and I will be who I will be. God is past, present, and future. So this is no surprise. God knows what they're going to do. So he's saying, why would you do it? And then he's concerned for God's honor. You made a promise, Lord, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. If you wipe out this people, you break that promise. That's what he's saying back to God. And you know... And the Lord relented from the disaster that he had spoken about bringing out of his people. God knows the beginning. He knows the end. But you know something? He gave us free will because we're called to love him. But you can't, love is nothing if you don't have free will. So we can freely love God. And you know something? The end is going to happen. The only question is, is Moses going to be faithful or not? Because like Mordecai told Esther in the book of Esther, you may think nothing's going to happen to you if you don't go to Mordecai or go to, um, uh, uh, go to the king, but... It will fall on you. But don't think that we're all going to be destroyed because God will raise up someone else. If Moses wouldn't intervene like this, he would have raised up someone else. But God knows the beginning from the end and everything in between. So we have to put in human terms that he changed his mind. He didn't change his mind. He knew exactly what was going to happen. The only question is Moses or someone else. That's the only question. And Moses answered that question. Then in verse 31, so Moses returned to the Lord, and alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your, your book that you have written. But the Lord said to Moses, whoever has sinned against me, I'll blot out of my book. But now, go, lead the people 
to the place which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. God didn't wink at their sin. They received punishment for it. But he did stop from the destruction of it. Moses intercede for that. You know, we're called to do the same thing. Our prayers account for something. Last year in James, we learned the prayer of a righteous person counts for a lot or avails for much. Moses' prayers were all focused on God and his honor and his holiness. That's a proper model for us. Then, then he asked God for mercy. He asked God to keep his presence with them and not to turn away. Only with God's presence do we have hope. And the question is, will we keep God as our central focus in all aspects of our life so his presence will be with us. That's the question for all of us. Then we come to the, the second part. We start out in verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, depart, go up from here, and you and the people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt to the land which I swore um, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he's going to send an angel before them to bring them to the land. He's going to do this, but he's not going to come because if I came with you, these are stiff-necked people. That means they're stubborn, they're set in their way. No matter what I show them, they're not going to change. You know people like that. You can argue with them and... To the end of days, and they're not going to change their mind. I just talked to somebody like that tonight, and I just decided, you know, I'm not, I have to come here and teach. I don't have the time, nor do I have the patience right now. And I said, thank you for your call, and I hung up. Because there's nothing I could say that was going to change that person's mind. And that's what God is saying. So I'm not going to go with you because I'll consume them. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord said to Moses, say to the people of Israel, you are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should be among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. Therefore they stripped themselves. Remember when they left Egypt? God gave them. All the riches, all the gold and the jewelry of the Egyptians. Actually, I'm kind of surprised Aaron didn't say, hey, it was God's fault I made the golden calf. He gave us the gold. If he wouldn't have done that, <laughs> can't you just hear that somewhere in there? But what is, what is uh, Moses do? Here's what he says to the Lord. See, you say to me, bring this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You, yet you have said, I will, I will know you by name, and you also will have found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation is your people. He keeps saying, it's your people. You're the one that brought them up, not me. And what he's saying is, I understand God, we're part of the promise, and I'm taking no credit for this. You're the one that took a family and made them into a nation. You took a man and woman who were past childbearing age, and you enabled them to have a child. These are your people you created. I was going to say something smart, Alex, so don't throw them off on me, but that wouldn't be right. 
Then God said, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do. This very thing. And then he says, the Lord, then, he, then I'll make goodness pass before you, and I will make uh, before my name the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I am gracious, and I'll show mercy to whom I show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. Moses asked to see God's face. You know how I look at that? Because other places, Abraham had lunch with God. Moses said, uh, God talks to me as um, one friend talks to another. Here's the way I see it. If we looked at the sun, we could not look at the core of the sun without losing our sight and everything else. But we see the rays of the sun, and we know the effect of the rays on here. I see the core of the sun as God, Yahweh. I see the rays as Jesus. I can see him. God, Yahweh, condescended himself to become a man. So something what we can see and hold on. And what did Jesus say to his people? If you see me, you see the Father. So when they're talking about that, I think it's a theophany or the pre-incarnate Jesus talking. And he is one and the same with Yahweh. But if you saw God's glory, it's all over for you. Because we could not handle it. Moses shows us how to walk with God today. Humbly before God. Humbly. And we are called to pray. We're called to have a personal relationship. And pray to him. Honor his name. Glorify his name. Understand that he's in control of everything. And then we can ask our needs. And we can ask with every fiber of our being. Only with God's presence will we have hope. And the way to have presence is to meet him in prayer, in worship, in study. The question is, will, will we intensely seek his presence like Moses did? We all have access to him, but will we seek him like Moses did? So now, chapter 34 is a victory chapter because God, after all this prayer and Moses' understanding, he says, uh, cut for yourself two tablets of stones like the first one and I'll write on these tablets that they, uh, like the words that I wrote the first one, which you broke, God reestablishes the covenant. Once again, God and the Israelites are married. Once again, God and Israel are married. He hooked, the, he hooked them together. The Lord, and Moses went up there with the two tablets and he wrote it with the finger of his hand and the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And here's our memory verse. I forgot that. I'm sorry. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and grace, gracious, Slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Keeping steadfast love for thousands. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. But who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Real quick. Real quick. He says, Yahweh. Yahweh. He says it twice. Eya asher eya. Eya asher eya. I am. There is no other Elohim God like me. And I'm showing you mercy and loving kindness. I should kill you. That's what the other Elohim would do that you're worshiping, but not me. I have grace on you. Yet, if you want to embrace the other gods, 
your iniquity will go down to your children, to your children, to your, your grandchildren, and to your great-grandchildren. There's a consequence of walking away from God. You don't have his compassion, and you don't have his mercy, and all the stuff we get ourselves into, and all our sins is going to flow down from generation to generation until we put a stop to it. And how do we put a stop to it? By falling on our face before the living God, asking him to forgive us. Asking him. He'll leave us in that condition until we say enough. I repent. You are God. You are the Lord. You are Yahweh. You are Yahweh. And there is no other gods. When we do that, what happened to Moses when he came down with his shiny face and everybody was fear? That happens to us. Jesus said, let your light shine before people in such a way that they may see your good works, that I'm totally dedicated to God and glorify your Father in heaven. You know, there is a difference. Of somebody who walks with the Lord. You can see it in their countenance. You can see it in their eyes. You can see it in their being. We shine. I think I told you uh, earlier, a friend of mine witnessed to a Muslim woman. And over a period of time, she became a believer. And her face is covered all the time. And she didn't know how to read. And they were teaching her how to read the Bible. That's how she was learning to read. But people, her husband... The other wives, her children saw her eyes and they saw something different. Her radiance, her light shined before them, gave glory to God and the whole family was saved. Moses was a foretaste of what we have. You want your light to shine before God? Give yourself to him. And when we're in God's presence, we have hope. I don't know what your circumstances you're facing today that you need hope for, but wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. If Israel would have done that, there would have been no great uh, golden calf. If we will do it, we will persevere. Let's pray. Thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for your, this instruction. This is something I needed selfishly to do tonight, to renew my hope. And give me the strength and courage to wait out the circumstances I'm in. And I know everybody is facing something. If we wait on you, Lord, your presence will be with us and there will be a way out. We just need to trust in you, Lord, to wait on you. We pray that we have this strength and that we'll do this. And we pray this in the name that, God, you said every knee would bow and every tongue confess, Jesus, our Messiah. Amen. Have a blessed Thanksgiving. See you Monday.